Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning, so if you have your Bibles, I will invite you to that chapter. But before we read that together and discuss it, I, I believe that I would be remiss if I did not uh, define some terms for you this morning and talk about where we've been and what we're doing at this point. Those of you who have been here the last two Sundays know that we've been discussing the ordinance of baptism, one of two ordinances that we practice in the Baptist church. And I always, I think, I really believe that it's good that we go back every now and then and reflect upon what we do and think about it. I think it's important that we don't lose sight of why we do what we do and what is the significance of what we do? What's the meaning behind it? And we spent two Sundays discussing the ordinance of baptism, looking back concerning where that came from, uh, what it means to us as Christians to participate in that ordinance. And we talked about the fact that it is a symbolic representation of what, what has happened to us in our conversion experience, where we have identified ourselves with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. And this is why we practice immersion as the form of baptism that we practice here. We believe that best pictures uh, the theology behind baptism, that we are immersed into the water as symbolic of our dying with Christ, going into the grave and then coming back out of the water is symbolic of our being raised unto new life. That's a picture of our conversion experience and our identification with Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again from the grave for our resurrection and uh, coming into new life with him. And we don't believe in the Baptist church that that physical act is what saves us. We believe it is symbolic of the fact that we have put our trust and our faith into Jesus Christ. And that's what saves us. We are saved by grace through faith, the Bible says. So we're not saved by actually being dunked into the water, if I could put it crudely. Uh, that's not what saves us. That physical act is not what does it. But rather, we are saved by faith. And so the, the picture, the image of baptism is a public display of what has happened to us spiritually. And this is what we talked about uh, in the last two Sundays. And we call this an ordinance. And today, we're going to be celebrating the ordinance of communion. I'd like to talk about what that means as well with you. And whether or not I can handle this in a single sermon is doubtful, but I'm going to do my best to do so. Um, because I, I really believe that we need to, I need to define some terms for you. Because I think there, it, sometimes we forget what these words mean. Like, I've been talking about the word ordinance the last two Sundays. What is an, what's an ordinance? Why don't we call it a sacrament? After all, other denominations call these things we're doing sacraments, don't they? And so, why do we call it an ordinance and not a sacrament? That's a definitional difference. And I want to give you the definitions of those things so we can begin to understand why we call it an ordinance and not a sacrament. There are other denominations that practice the sacrament of the Eucharist or communion as we call it. And let me give you a definition of a sacrament and this will begin to help us to see why we call this, we wanna call it an ordinance. A sacrament is a, is a sign or a rite which results in God's grace being conveyed to the individual, okay? It's a sacrament, it, it, it is a sign or a rite in which God's grace is being conveyed to the individual. And of these denominations that practice sacraments, there are seven sacraments that they refer to. And these include baptism, confirmation, holy communion, confession, marriage, holy orders, and anointing the sick. And it is believed by these denominations that when these things are done, that these become dispensers of grace into the individual. And a lot of these denominations will say this, these are necessary for salvation. Now, if we believe as 
as I hope we all do here, that we are saved by grace through faith, then this is, begins to help us to understand why we don't call these things that we do sacraments. Because there's a difference, a definitional difference. An, ordin an ordinance, on the other hand, is something different. Ordinances are visual aids. They are symbolic reenactments, if you will, of the things that we have embraced spiritually, the things that we embrace by faith that, has, that we believe have happened to us. And the reason why we want to call baptism and the Lord's Supper ordinances is because we think that better fits what the Bible actually says about these things. Again, if we believe that we are saved by grace through faith, then when we begin to say that, well, there are other things that we have to do to generate God's grace being dispensed to us, then we're no longer in the grace and faith category anymore. You see, we've gone a, we've gone a different direction. Um, and so it's important that we recognize why we call this an ordinance. And it's because we do not believe that these activities actually dispense grace to us. Uh, we believe that they are reenactments. They depict something that has happened in the past for us on our behalf that we have embraced by faith, you see. And so the question is, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper then? As an ordinance, what does it mean to us? to engage in this activity. Well, we've already hinted at that. It is a reenactment. It is a place that we go every now and then uh, to remind us of something, to remind us where we came from, who we are, what we're supposed to be up to here in this church, in the church universal and in the church locally. Um, and so it's a good idea to go back and look at, look at where this originated. And we read from the Gospel of Luke, during our responsive reading, what is called the Last Supper. And the Last Supper took place at a supper that was celebrated annually by the Jews. It's called the Passover. This is where it was originated. Now, what is the Passover? The Passover itself is also a reenactment of an event that the Jews prized and held up you know, pretty substantially in their history. The Passover was celebrating the Exodus, how they were delivered from the slavery of Egypt through God, through Moses, by God. And the, the symbolisms that are present in the Passover are highly significant in terms of reenacting that event. Now, in that reenacting of that event, there was no addition of sanctification or grace that came through the participation in the Passover. The, the Jews simply did not believe that that's what was going on. They believed that they were doing what the Bible often said that they needed to do, and that is they needed to remember something. Because oftentimes we forget things as human beings. We forget where we came from. We forget what, is, what we're supposed to be doing. And so going back and reenacting these events through the symbolic display of these activities helps us to once again come back to where it all originated. And for the Jews, God had delivered them from the slavery of Egypt. And that was a highly significant event for them. And so every year they thought it was necessary to celebrate this, to celebrate it through a meal. What do meals signify in the ancient world, they signified something and very important. This is where covenants were made. At the table is where people sat down and they would share a meal together and they would make agreements and establish covenants. There's a great example that we saw about this idea of a table and, and, and food being served at a table in our study on Wednesday nights from the book of Daniel. And you know the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had been ripped out of their homeland by the Babylonians and taken to Babylon. And they were being re-educated there in the courts of, of, of Babylon. And during that time there, they were invited to eat from the king's table. And that table 
consisted of meats and wines and various delicacies that Daniel and his friends decided they did not really want to participate in that. And there's been a lot of discussion about why they, they didn't want to do that. Some have suggested, well, they wanted to stay kosher. You know, that, that's why they didn't want to eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine. I don't think that's what was going on there at all. Because we know that later on, they did in fact eat from the king's table. They ate those meats and drank those wines. So that really wasn't the issue for them. I think that what was at stake here for them was the symbolism of eating from the king's table. What did that mean? This was at the very beginning of their orientation in, into Babylon, their re-education, if you will, when they were being indoctrinated with all kinds of new ideas. And think about this. You had been taken from your homeland, put into a foreign nation, and now you were being trained to think and act like a Babylonian. And these were Jewish men, young men. And so how do I maintain my identity? How do I stay faithful to Yahweh, to the Lord, in the midst of this upheaval of my life? And I think what they were, what they were really trying to do was they were trying to say, look, there's nothing we can do about this. We're stuck here in this place. However, we don't have to accept this linkage that, we, that would be symbolized by, by during this orientation time of us eating from the king's table. Because to do that would symbolize coming into a, a patronage, if you will, coming into an allegiance to the king of Babylon. And this was going one step too far for them. So what they decided to do in a private way, this was not publicly done, in a private way, to maintain their integrity and their commitments and faithfulness to the Lord by not eating from the king's table, you see. And because that represents something significant. It's a covenantal type of thing. We're saying that we are completely and utterly committed to you now by eating at your table. They said, no, we can't do this. We don't want to do this. And so this is why they refrain from it. So you can see that the symbolism of the table is highly significant. One of the things we call the communion, we refer to when we take communion, is we call this the Lord's table because it's symbolically representing something. And in the elements as they were distributed to the disciples, Jesus said he referred to a new covenant when he held up the cup. He said, this cup represents the blood of my covenant for you, you see. So the meal itself being served at a table is a covenantal banquet. In the future, one day, the Bible tells us that we're going to be sitting at a table. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that itself is a covenantal symbolic representation of our union with Christ, which we will experience one day in reality. And so all of this is extremely important as background for understanding what Jesus was doing with his disciples and what the Apostle Paul wants to remind the Corinthians about in a moment. We'll take a look at that. But let me just say something about the cups, because I think that's important to understand. At the Passover, there were four cups that would be that would be uh, uh, drunk during the course of the Passover meal. Each one of those cups at, it, at its significant point when it would be drunk had a meaning behind it. And it goes back to the Exodus. To be specific, Exodus chapter 6 is where we, where we can make the linkage to those cups. And they represent various aspects of God's promise to his people. The first cup that would be drunk is called the cup of sanctification. And from Exodus 6, this phrase is linked to it. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. That's the first cup, what it symbolizes. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. The second cup is called the cup of judgment. It's where God says, I will deliver you from their, from their bondage. And of course, we know that the plagues represent judgments. Uh, the book of Exodus refers to those plagues as God bringing judgments 
upon the gods of Egypt. Each one of those plagues represents something about the gods of Egypt, that God is judging them. And the third cup is called the cup of redemption. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. And the fourth cup is the cup of praise. I will take you for my people and I will be your God. When Jesus held up the cup, it was the third cup that he held up. It was the third cup. He did not drink the fourth cup with them. And I believe this is the cup that he is referring to when he says, I will not drink again until the kingdom. You see, that's pointing to the future. But the third cup is the cup of redemption. Why? Because he is the redeemer. And he says, this is a new covenant that I'm making with you. You see. And so all of this kind of comes together. This is why I've said in the past, it's important that we make sure we understand our theology from the narrative of scripture. How does it fit in with the overall story in the Bible? You see, if we can stay within the narrative of scripture, then we can, then we can see it more clearly. If we take it out of the narrative of scripture, then we can end up attaching meanings to it that it may not have. And this is what I think happens when, when, when traditions come in and, and sort of distort the narrative meaning of these pictures that are in the Bible for us. For example, some denominations believe that the meaning of the Last Supper is something different than what I think we can see from this, the narrative in the Bible. For instance, some churches teach the idea that's called transubstantiation. You ever heard that before? What is transubstantiation? Well, it's, it, it, it's something like this. The bread and the, and the wine actually turn into the body and blood of Jesus when a certain prayer, a, a prayer of consecration is made before it is served. It actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus when that prayer is, is, is said. Um, this is an idea that is sometimes based upon John chapter 6, which in the flow of John's gospel, in the narrative of John's gospel, it has nothing to do with communion. It's seven chapters separated from any discussion about communion in the gospel of John. John's discussion of communion comes much later in the chapter. In fact, if you look at the context of John chapter 6, where Jesus uses these words, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life, Jesus explains what he means by that. He says, whoever comes to me, that's what he's equating with eating my flesh, and whoever believes in me, he equates with drinking his blood, will have eternal life. And then the narrative of John's gospel, this is connected with the people that have followed him after he's fed the 5,000. They still follow him around. And he says, you're not following me for the right reason. You're only following me because you want, continue to want to get food from me, you know, physical bread and, and food from me. He says, you need to see that the real food that comes from heaven is what I'm offering to you. And then he goes into this explanation of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He equates that to believing in him. In fact, later on, he says to his disciples, some of you don't believe in me. Because when he gets through with that discussion, some of his disciples decide not to follow him anymore because they find his teaching too hard. And he says, this is necessary because some of you don't actually believe in me. He doesn't say, some of you haven't eaten my flesh and drunk my blood. He says, because you haven't believed in me. So clearly in that context, it is completely symbolic when he makes those statements about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Um, I don't want to get into a lot of detail and discussion about these ideas of transubstantiation. And then there's another one called consubstantiation. The word trans actually means that there's a change that takes place within it. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what, if, if it actually changes into the, the flesh and blood of Jesus, how come it still looks like a wafer and it still looks like wine or juice? Well, there's, 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 a, there's a way that that is described by those who practice that. There's a way that they can get around that. They say, uh, and again, this is based upon some philosophical distinctions. They say, 
that the substance changes, but the accidental qualities of the bread and wine remain the same. So it still looks and tastes like bread and wine, but substantially it becomes the body and blood of Christ. So that's, that's how that is, that is explained. What do we practice? What do we believe? We practice what's called memorialism. This is the idea that is actually expressed in our statement of faith at the church, which reads like this. This comes from our actual bylaws, or constitution and bylaws. We believe that baptism is by immersion and the Lord's Supper is a memorial to his suffering and death on the cross. These ordinances are to be observed by the church in its present age. So even in our own statement of faith at this church, we call this a memorial, okay? In fact, isn't that exactly what Jesus himself said in the gospel account? Do this in remembrance of me, he says. Do this in remembrance of me. We don't have to speculate about what the meaning of communion is, what the meaning of the Lord's Supper is. Jesus tells us, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do demonstrate, reenact the Lord's death until he comes. Why do we need to do that? Because we need to be reminded of the significance of that. How do we know we need to be reminded? Well, we got a really good example in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, let me just preface this by telling you something about the church at Corinth. The church of Corinth was established when on one of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. He went there and about, they speculate it's about AD 50. He spent two years there. Corinth was a very diverse city. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And uh, Paul was there for two years. Then he left and went to Ephesus where he was there for three years. While he was in Ephesus, he wrote 1 Corinthians sent this letter to them. Why did he do this? Well, he did it because he received either a letter from the church at Corinth or some folks from the, the church came to visit him. I like to call these people whistleblowers because they came with a, with a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems going on at the church at Corinth. And uh, if you read 1 Corinthians, you can see this. He's addressing one issue after another. Lots of problems, lots of disputes, some stuff going on in that church that was just not good. Now, we think that Paul, this is not, we think that this is probably not the first letter he wrote to that church because he does make a reference to a previous letter um, in, in this letter. That letter has been lost. We don't have it, but we do have this one. One of the problems that he addresses, he feels so he feels this is so important that he needs to remind them about what the purpose of the Lord's Supper is. What is the problem? Well, let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me get my glasses on so I can see. Verse 17. Now, in giving the following instruction... I do not praise you. Doesn't sound good from the get-go, does it? Since you come together, he's talking about coming together for the Lord's Supper, not for the better, but for the worse. See, for to begin with, this is when he's going to start. Okay, listen, let, listen to what he says. Since when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, when you come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you're not really doing it. You're not really doing it, is what he's saying. It's for the worse. It's not reflecting in your own life and experience what the Lord's Supper symbolizes. Okay, that's what he's saying. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. There must indeed be factions among you so that the approved among you may be recognized. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. See, there's where he says it. It's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. It's like you're going through the motions, but you're really not doing it. You see, 
For in eating, verse 21, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one person is hungry while another is drunk. Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on the church of God and embarrass those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you for this, he says. What's going on? What are they doing? Well, one of the things that the Lord's Supper represents, and this is included in the idea of the bread, because what are we called? The church is called the body of Christ. What's the bread represent? The body of Christ. And we each are a part of the body of Christ. So that, that little piece of bread that you take comes from one loaf. Okay, that's what it does. It comes from one loaf. And each piece of it is a part of the whole. We are individuals, but we belong to one thing, the church, the body of Christ, you see. And so when you take that, you are saying that you belong and you are in unity and your communion with the entire body. But what's happened at Corinth? They are not in union. There are divisions. And one of the divisions that Paul is concerned about is the division between the wealthy and the poor. The wealthy tended to have lives of leisure. So what do they do? When they get together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, they celebrated it around a meal. They don't do it like we do where we tack it on at the end of the service. They centered it on a meal to try to reflect as much as possible the, the last supper that Jesus did with his disciples. So that's what they were doing. But the wealthy would show up early because they didn't have to work. They would show up early. And what they, what they did was they would start eating right away. And by the time the poor got off work and got there, the wealthy had eaten everything, had drunk all the wine, and they were filled and drunk. The poor show up, there's nothing left for them. They go hungry. This shows a lack of concern. Why aren't they waiting for one another so they can be in unity when they partake of the Lord's Supper together, which better symbolizes and represents what they're about. The reason they don't wait is because they don't care about each other. They don't, they don't see the importance of recognizing that we're all a part of the same body. And then Paul says, let me remind you of something to get you back on track. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when you fail, Paul is saying, to recognize the others, you're forgetting me. He says, you're forgetting what you're supposed to be about, your identification with me. He says, in the same way, verse 25, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This is a covenant, symbolic of the covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're reenacting it. You're showing your relationship to it, he says. But then he goes on and gives his warning. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of, of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself. In this way, he should eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Because if you eat and drink without recognizing the body, See? See how specific he is? You will eat and drink judgment on yourself, he says. He goes on to describe what that judgment was looking like at Corinth. We don't have time to get into all the details there. But then he says in verse 33, Therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that you can come together and not cause judgment. You see, and so in, in the context of Paul's epistle, he's saying that when it comes to the Lord's Supper, 
examining yourself, judging yourself so that you won't be judged, has to do with making sure that, that this, the picture that you are proclaiming, that you are showing, represents the reality of the church. Because if it doesn't, it will bring judgment, you see. In other words, if, if we are not truly a body, if we are not truly uh, one and we recognize one another and value one another the way we're supposed to be, then we're telling a lie when we partake of the communion, of the, of the supper. See, we're not speaking the truth in terms of it's representing the truth about who we are in Christ, you see. And that was the concern that Paul had for the church at Corinth. So deep was his concern that he thought it was important to remind them about it, remind them about what the foundation, what the origin was in terms of the covenant that is in the cup and the importance of the unity that is in the bread. We don't believe that the bread and the cup turn into something else when we pray. We believe that it is a symbolic symbol. It's a representation of the reality. And so when we partake of it, we have to be sure, we have to make sure that we are telling the truth when we engage in the activity. You see, let's not call this something that it's not. Let's call it what it really is. It's a picture of the covenant that we have entered into with Jesus Christ and with one another. It's a picture of our unity as one body, the body of Christ. Let's not quarrel with one another. Let's not let petty things get in the way. Let's be true to what we are supposed to be.